Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel on Think Tech Hawaii. This is Life in the Law, and we have a, I guess it's a legal show, uh, <laughs> with John David Ann, professor of history at, uh, at uh, HPU, and he's been on the show many times, and he's helped us understand events in the context of history, because historians right. think differently. Right. So we're going to talk about the election of uh, Donald Trump as President of the United States yesterday, and, and where this extraordinary result fits in the context of American history, mm world history mm. and history uh, going forward. Thank you for helping us understand this, John. You're welcome, Jay. Glad to be here. So, um, you know, the, the, the broad reach of American history says that this is, of course, a, an historic election. Um, you had uh, the first time uh, a female candidate for president from the Democratic side, and then the election of Trump um, on the Republican side. and uh, you know, uh, it, it's historic in several ways. I mean, the polls, of course, were all wrong. Um, it's historic in, in bringing out uh, uh, high school educated uh, whites in, uh, uh, in, a, his, in a historic uh, manner. Um, it's historic because uh, the, the last time we had somebody who didn't have government experience elected was uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, but of course Eisenhower had all kinds of military experience and tremendous organizational experience, mm -hmm. which I've, I think definitely helped him. So, um, you know, we elected a really a, a somebody who doesn't have any governing experience whatsoever. Um, Did they know what they were getting when they voted for him? I mean, it's been such a such a humbug about what people yeah. have said in this yeah. election. Um, do they know? Do they realize what they got? Well, I, th I think it's, it's clear that the, uh, the, the feeling was that there needed to be a change, and that and the, ins the insurgents won the day throughout the election cycle. And, and that's, you know, that's kind of one of, that's one of the biggest takeaways. Um, th the thing is, we've seen this not just in the United States, but we saw it with Brexit in Same England. Thing, yeah. Uh, you know, about five or six months ago, and and so th and while there are many differences between the two, uh, the global context is that there is a sense that people in uh, uh, in in uh, first world countries or countries, you know, uh, developed countries, developed economies, are feeling afraid. There's a great sense of fear. I mean, fear drove the Brexit. Uh, uh, you know, fear in many ways. Trump. Trump really trumpeted fear. Uh, you know, he, he talked a lot about uh, terrorists. He talked a lot about illegal immigrants. He talked a lot about people threatening us from the outside. <clears throat> so uh, there's the, the takeaway here is that we're, we're getting a lot of pushback on globalization. This process of the world becoming more integrated now is having impacts that are being felt at home in small towns across the United States, and and those folks are unhappy with the results. Connect it up for me. What what makes them afraid about globalization? Well, I think uh, th they see. I mean, there, there's this kind of uh, old adage that you know, uh, in in the United States, you can expect that you'll do better than your parents, and your your children will do better than you did. Uh, but that's no longer true. Uh, incomes have been uh, stagnant in the working classes and the lower middle class. Um, th there seem to be fewer opportunities for, you know, moving up. Uh, the, you know, large-scale manufacturing has offshored. So uh, there's fear that, that their opportunities and their children's opportunities will be foreclosed. And, you know, I think that's there's legitimacy in that, but of, co of course there's also many irrational fears that drove voters to the polls as well. You know, f fear of Ebola, fear of disease, fear of, fear of jihadis, you know, uh, uh, fear of anybody who's not like you because Trump, of course, made that a major part of his campaign yeah. to talk to these people and then, and then talk against other people, people of color, uh, women, uh, you know, uh, so... It was very, unfortunately, I think it was very negative. Uh, and catalytic, result. wouldn't you say? In other words, somebody may not realize that he doesn't like minorities. Uh, somebody may not realize that uh, he's afraid of jihadi uh, to the point where he would act on And then a guy like this comes around, right. and he, he's a uh, catalyst. Makes you, it yeah. pulls you out of the yeah. closet. Yeah, it, it, gives, it gives voice 
to their fears and it and it empowers them uh, so so fortunately I, I think it's it's a good thing that we haven't had any violence uh, so far after the election yeah. I mean I think that's that's definitely positive but uh, of course after the brexit there were racist slogans and and anti-immigrant slogans that and so these folks kind of came out of the woodwork um, and we're probably going to see some of that quite frankly um, but we haven't seen it yet, and I think that's a good thing so far. Let me, let me ask you something that occurs to me <clears throat> yeah. from a historical evolution point of view. Right. History and politics, and for that matter, the economy, all seems to me, in, in, my, in my way of looking at it, a function of how the group, the society, mm. is feeling. Mm. If they're feeling optimistic, you like to see more entrepreneur activity, better economy. Mm -hmm. If they're feeling pessimistic, well, nobody wants to do anything, and they're afraid. Uh, that's putting it in gross terms, but yep. it seems to me that history is probably loaded with this kind of sine curve, where in good times you're feeling good, in bad times you're feeling bad, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I, I think more than just good or bad times, it's times that are transformational. And yes. globalization has transformed the American economy, it's transformed American society, um, and so uh, the, this, there was another time to use history as an example, there was another time when we were going through a pretty substantial transformation, and that was during the first industrial revolution in the 18, about, from about 1815 to about 1850. And during that first time period, we had an election, we had several elections in which uh, the, uh, this transformation uh, created a situation where people became afraid they voted their fears, uh, they voted for change, and uh, in that case, uh, the, starting in the, uh, the election of 1824, and then with, in 1828, with the election of Andrew Jackson, and then in 1832, uh, you had the development... He was elected again. That's correct, when he was re-elected. Uh, you have the development of a coalition of people, in, uh, farmers in the West, slaveholders in the South, who were afraid of industrialization. They were afraid that industrialization would take away their livelihoods. Uh, and their know, slaves. And, and their slaves and, and uh, corrupt them. There were all kinds of different arguments about why industrialization was bad. But so uh, Andrew Jackson used this. He used industrialization and he used the hatred of Eastern elites, especially the U.S. National Bank. This became the, the focus of his uh, efforts uh, to rouse people was his attack on the U.S. National Bank. Um, uh, but in, in, a, in a weird uh, coincidence, wasn't, wasn't Andrew Jackson the architect of the Trail of Tears it, across Georgia? That, that's true, yes, so, he was. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of Trumpian comparison there. Well, no, no I mean, uh, but of course he wasn't the only president to, to uh, force Indians to move west. I mean, yeah. you know, he, that was one of the most egregious examples of Indians being dispossessed of their land. But I think that the thing about Jackson is he used these fears about this transformation to get elected, and then he attacked the National Bank and eventually destroyed the U.S. National Bank. There were some who celebrated the bank, of course, was an instrument of economic development. And the, uh, the other party, the Whigs, supported the National Bank and state banks. Uh, but Jackson created the first Democratic Party. This is the same Democratic Party that we have today. Continuously, all these that's, years. That's yeah. correct. He created that in 1932 with his attacks on the bank. Make it 1832. Uh, pardon me, 1832 <laughs> with his attacks on the bank. That's 200 years, <laughs> almost. That's, yeah. that's a long time, but it's a... But so, so that created a new political formation, which came into the Civil War supporting slavery, and then, of course, its opponent, the Republican Party, came into the Civil War of uh, rejecting slavery or wanting to uh, limit slavery, and, uh, you know, a, a, a war, a civil war took place over it. Am I right to think that the Republican Party has been through more changes, you know, really 180-degree type changes, than the Democratic Party? Democratic Party been um, more consistent over these 200 years? No, no I wouldn't no. say what that. Of course, the, the Democratic Party was the party of, of slavery. Uh, of slavery. Of slavery. Oh, okay, okay. And then the Democratic Party became the party's, the solid, so switch. solid South uh, <laughs> Democratic Party was the party of segregation, um, the party of, uh, of free trade. I mean, this is, this. The name is the same, but actually it's very different. So what we see is a transformation of the Democratic Party in the 1930s 
40s and 50s uh -huh. into the party that it more like what it is today with yeah, yeah, the party yeah. of uh, multiculturalism and minorities but you you know i mean people are coming at this election i mean everybody's sort of settling down now you know last night it was like crisis yeah <clears throat> but they're settling down uh in the notion and i think this is firmly held around my world anyway that this is unpre unprecedented what happened here is that, is that true or well, have there been American elections like this in the past? Well, I, I really think the Andrew Jackson election is a, is a good example. So I don't think it's completely unprecedented. Jackson had not served in government uh, previously. He was, a, he was a slaveholder, you know, and a plantation owner. And, and he, he had certain interests around which he was able to coalesce his coalition. Now, tr it's not clear that Trump, I mean, Trump lost a popular vote, so it's not clear that he's been able to assemble a coalition. He might not even be interested in a coalition, but he did, in fact, use fear, and I think that's where he and Jackson uh, have some similarities. Uh, and it's a kind of backward-looking vision, right? It's a, it's a vision of loss. People have lost something, and now they're looking to regain it, and Trump would grade again, right? That mm -hmm. rhetoric resonates with people who feel like they've lost something. And uh, the same was true for Western farmers and, and Southern plantation holders in the, the 1830s. So I think that's probably the closest election in terms of, in terms of an analogy, in terms of parallels. Um, you know, the, the, the thing about Trump is his language is very strong, unrestrained language. Uh, you could call him a demagogue because he was using pre prejudice and, and uh, uh, that kind of language to forward prejudice and and so um did jackson was jackson the de a demagogue jackson in some ways was a demagogue when it came to the national bank and to the american currency i mean he he was definitely using american prejudice against uh, eastern elites to get elected um jackson became a nationalist though Interesting. Uh, in 18... Uh, the, Transformation yeah, for him. That, uh, in, in the 1820s and 30s, when he was president, he had to confront issues of possible uh, secession, sectional issues, and he became a nationalist. So um, will Trump become a nationalist? I, I'm, I, I don't know, honestly. Well, from a historical point of view, you know, one thing, maybe we're not used to it because we're not historians. Um, but if you look at this election, you know, you see the rhetoric was really uh, out of this world uh, from Trump. Yep. The incredible things he yep. said yep. and that he has said in his lifetime that, that came out. Um, and the, the question is, uh, oh, and then we expect him to be Mr. President. And people already right. in the media are calling him right. President Trump. It's right. hard to hear that. It's hard yeah. to yeah, tolerate that. Um, but but you, you have this possibility that he'll clean his act, he'll clean up. Uh, and, and I wonder if this kind of thing do you know about this, has happened in the past, oh, where sure. the president yeah. had horrendous rhetoric and well, then cleaned his act up when he was in office. Well, the rhetoric is pretty unprecedented. Um, uh, it, it's the, uh, in the past, we definitely have had uh, candidates that weren't ready. Okay, uh, I think George W. Bush, in many ways, was not ready for the office. Um, Harry Truman was not ready for the office. Uh, Warren G. Harding was not ready for the office and never really, you know, this, so, so Truman and Bush, I think, are examples of individuals who were able to take the office and then eventually became kind of uh, leaders that we can at least respect. Uh, Warren G. Harding, not so much. That's an example of a, of a he was, of course, a politician, uh, uh, of, of a president where it really didn't work, and he never really was terribly successful in his presidency. Uh, will we have a Warren G. Harding, or will we have a Harry Truman in Trump? I'm concerned that uh, we might end up with a Warren G. Harding. Yeah, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the real problem is that in the, in the nuclear age, and in the world of technology, and as you say, global transformation, uh, we, don't, we, we have to be very careful because things move so fast, and if there's a mistake, the consequences could be not only national, but global. Right. So let's take a short break. That's uh, John David Ann. He's a professor of history at HPU. He's helping us understand the real meaning of Election Day, and that is something we need to focus on. We'll be right back. Join us at Think Tech of Hawaii. Our show is Asia in Review. Our next program is on November 17. This is Johnson Choi, your host. Aloha, I'm Richard Emery. I'm with co-host Jane Sugimura of Condo Insider. 
Hawaii's weekly show about association living. The uh, purpose of these videos is to educate board members and condo residents about issues uh, relating uh, to association living. Uh, we hope they're helpful and uh, that they uh, assist in resolving uh, problems that uh, affect the relationship uh, between boards and their residents. Each week, Thursday at 3 p.m., we bring you exciting guests, industry experts, who for free will share their advice about how to make your association a better place to live and answer a lot of very interesting questions. Aloha. We hope you'll tune in. Okay, let's, let's go back to uh, 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 the days of Andrew Jackson for a minute. Um, because Andrew Jackson, who was, who was a veteran, by the way, he was the guy that led the American forces correct. to recover the city of New Orleans that's back correct. in 1812. As right. I recall, yeah. Yes, no, that's correct. So he was pretty hard, hard nosed, hard, uh, thick skinned. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, he was a very tough guy. Um, and uh, he knew exactly what he wanted. He was suspicious of, uh, of uh, uh, paper currency, he was suspicious of the tariff. There's the Congress and uh, uh, John Quincy Adams administration had passed a very heavy tariff, which helped manufacturers but hurt farmers. Farmers needed to buy things to do their business. Manufacturers wanted to sell things domestically and tariffs protected them. And uh, so he, he ran against tariffs in 1828 and won on that basis. Uh, and then he ran against the bank, the, the U.S. National Bank in 1832 and won again on that basis. And, and you're talking about the rhetoric around that uh, That's right. Issue. And, and, and relatively, he, he coalesced relatively uneducated people into of a real political force. Well, this is <laughs> it's chilling, isn't it? <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, um, you know. So th yeah. there, it is. There are definitely some comparisons yeah. there. I want to shift to uh, the international implications, yeah. um, and that means uh, Europe. You know, in this morning's uh, press, there were quotes from a variety of European leaders. Some of them were pro forma, as you always say, no matter who was elected. Right. Some of them were you know, cautious, yep. like I think the yep. French government was cautious. Mm. Um, what's really happening out there? How do they really react to him? Right, well, I just heard a report before we came on from about Russia, and the Russians are ecstatic. They loved Trump, and they, uh, they think he'll, he will heal the wounds between the United States and Russia. And, um, is that real or is it just gameplay? Well, no, I think the, the sentiment is real, that they think he can heal relations with Russia, and it's interesting because number one, it indicates that the Russians are very concerned about the U.S. Russia, the decline of the U.S. Russian relationship. But number two, it suggests that they think that somehow he's going to play to their hand, and I, I don't think that's going to happen. So the president, of course, has a great deal of power in terms of foreign policy, not so much in terms of domestic yeah, issues. True. But, yeah. but the president also has to work with his secretary of state, um, and really can do. Uh, very little absolutely on his own without, you know, without uh, a, a policy class and, uh, and a, a bureaucratic apparatus to make those things happen. So, um, you know, we might see some movement on the Syria issue. That's one area where uh, Trump could come in and say, hey, let's work together and let's, let's just resolve this conflict. And, and so you might see the United States pulling out from the rebel forces there. Uh, and allowing the Russians to have their way there. Um, you know, Trump is totally untutored in foreign policy. Uh, his, his, you know, I think the mo some of the most frightening statements, we're going to, you know, uh, give, give our creditors a haircut on their, you know, on our debt. It's like, okay, that would destroy the good, good faith and credibility of the American dollar and the American economy. And the reserve currency. That's right. And then he's talking about... Um, pulling out troops from East Asia. Japan has to carry more of its own uh, payment for American troops. Uh, troops might come home. Um, uh, NATO is outdated and might disappear or, or be really weakened under a Trump administration. Uh, but all of those things will tend to weaken American influence. And I have a hard time believing that over time, over a couple of year period, if he makes, if he pulls the, the trigger on these decisions, that there will not be this tremendous backlash within the United States and within the international community. I mean, he's, if he does this, he's playing with fire. And, uh, you know, I, I think he'll be a one-termer. 
if, if he uh, tries to do some of this, because there's way too many entrenched interests in this country who benefit greatly from globalization, who benefit greatly from the strength of the American economy, um, and who benefit from the strength of the American military and the American political influence around the world. So I, I have a hard time believing that he's going to be able to accomplish okay. what he said. It could be that a good bit of it was simply campaign rhetoric. The thing about domestic issues is that, um, you know, you can deceive a lot of the people a long time before they, you know, realize yeah. what's happened right, right. and take action right. against you. Right. Uh, on the other hand, in, you know, in the domestic setting, um, well, uh, you have to go to Congress to get relief, uh, do. and maybe there's an impeachment there right. uh, if he if he does bad things or fails to you know fails to cure the problems he he promised to cure. <clears throat> but what, what I find really interesting is the notion that he could be acting ultra vires on a given international issue, something that's not authorized either by law yeah. or or by the Constitution, no. and he can take some kind of crazy action that would be very provocative, even even warlike. Um, and what, how does the country stop him? Mm. Uh, they, I guess it would have to be an impeachment, uh, and that, that you have to have high crimes yeah. and misdemeanors, yeah. which is not so easy to prove, um, as we know. And, and then if there is an impeachment, it takes a lot longer to do an impeachment than it took to do the illegal act in the first place. The right. uh, right. result is he could get away with it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not so, you know, like I say, I, I, th I think it, you know, Trump doing stuff on his own, absolutely on his own, or, you know, saying to his advisors, look, I'm going to do this, I don't care what you think, which is, of course, what he did in the campaign, and it's a concern, definitely, but I think he's going to find it much more difficult to do that once he takes office. I really do. Um, there's, you know, one decision, and there will be immediate consequences and immediate blowback from that decision, so... Um, uh, you know, I'm not quite as concerned about that. Maybe I should be, but I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, I retain some faith that what we have is a, an American system, not just a president. And uh, I think it's the, it's the accumulation of changes and the long-term uh, impacts of some of those changes which, which could, um, well, in the international arena, damage American credibility yes. and lead to the decline of the United States as a world power. Well, the further decline, depending on how well, you look at Well, you mean you can interpret it in many ways, but, I mean, still we have the strongest economy in the world, we have the largest military in the world, we have, right now we still have the most influence of any country in the world, far and away. But uh, I do think that that's under threat if Trump moves in directions you know, that he's indicated, that we could, we could see a, a much more, or, or a precipitous decline in American power in the world. And, this, you know, the thing is, globalization is integrated, right? I mean, it's, you can't do one thing without it impacting the other thing. So um, taking action on some of these things, maybe in terms of geopolitics, could, w could impact the American economy back home. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to wait and see what he does. Uh, but uh, certainly his campaign rhetoric has uh, uh, produced fear. It's it's calmed those who were afraid, but it's also produced tremendous fear among those who oppose him. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, uh, one interesting, and t taking your point about a one-term president, yeah. let's assume that he makes mistakes, not impeachable mistakes, yeah. um, blowback mistakes, but mm -hmm. not impeachable mistakes, yeah. for, for four years and gets through that, and then he's not reelected. And, and this involves a lot of damage to uh, Amer American interests overseas, yeah. Yeah. its reputation, influence, you know, in the world today. And, of course, that doesn't come by itself because as, as we lose influence, China, Russia, other places gain influence. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a, you know, yeah. zero-sum game yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, so the, my question, though, is that yeah. if he does things mm -hmm. that cost us, mm. cost us maybe even the reserve currency, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. is that reversible after the four years? I always thought that whatever George Bush with W was doing, yeah. we couldn't really recover from it yeah. because he was in office. Right. Uh, right. What's, what's the process well, it's, these it's, days? I, I, th I think reversing it, I mean, George W. Bush, of course, led an invasion into Iraq. And that has had implications right up to the present day in our domestic political process. It's emboldened jihadis, you know, it's, it's probably helped to elect Trump, ironically. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so we don't really know how these things will play out. History has its own trajectory. Uh, and it's, it's, it might not be the reverse 
or reversing those policies. There might be a new paradigm that arises from this in which others can, can benefit from Trump's mistakes in, in political ways and then maybe uh, 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 do recovery or whatever. But taking a, the specific example of the reserve currency. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if Trump actually was able to implement a policy of creditors taking a discount, that would destroy the United States as uh, and the American dollar as a as a reserve currency. No one would would want to invest in the United States then, and and huge effect on the stock market. Yeah, yeah, that would that would really really deeply damage the American economy. That would not be something that you could recover from, or j at least not over a short period of time recover from. And China, of course, has made the argument that uh, their yuan is a s kind of a second reserve currency. China has built its own Asian Development Bank. They've got the Silk Road uh, initiative in, in Western China for the Central Asian countries. So they're making a lot of investments and China would likely be able to, uh, they might not be able to take over uh, the world as a reserve currency, but they would make inroads in terms of their own currency being the reserve currency rather than the United yeah, States. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, there, we're that's talking hard about, to reverse that. We, we're, yes. You can't turn that around. Yeah, really I think that's that that particular thing uh, yeah, would be yeah. very difficult to turn around. But. You know, one one thing is uh, part of his campaign and his rhetoric has been to attack the government, the way it works. And you know, there's a valid attack there because right. people are not as connected to the right, government. Right. They're not re responsive, respect, uh, respectful of the government. And, and uh, regrettably, uh, you know, if you have a certain critical mass of people feeling that way, it does affect uh, yeah. the way the system yeah. works. The right. system doesn't work right. so well. Right. So now, there's a, there's, uh, last week, I think it was, uh, NPR reported a, uh, a conference in China where one member of the Politburo got up and said, you know, our system in China, you can criticize us, you can criticize on human <laughs> rights, you can criticize us yeah. on you know and the way we do things, but but in reality we're we're not so bad, and when yeah. we compare ourselves against the against the United States, we're yeah. looking better every day. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so it, and talking <clears throat> about democracy, morality, um, right. you know right. the 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 benefits of democracy uh, as it has emerged to be the best system. Yeah. So query, John, yeah. where is it? Where is democracy well, going now? Yeah. Okay. So. Democracy has defi definitely taken a hit in the last, uh, I would say, since 2000 uh, with the, uh, I mean, any time you have an election where the popular vote goes one way and the electoral college goes another way, that's a hit. That's damage to democracy. And we've had it twice in the last 16 years. This is unprecedented. Uh, there were two other times when, uh, when it happened, uh, but uh, long ago, um, you know, 1880, election of 1888, election of 1876, and then course in the election of 1824 but John Adams didn't win either <laughs> and he still <laughs> okay. became president so but the, the, the thing about it is that um, it's it's what is what happened in this election is the Republican Congress which refused to work with the president right and so things didn't work and there was gridlock and in some ways Americans were voting against gridlock, but they voted back into power the party that was causing the gridlock. <laughs> That's so, really ironic. So this is this is not a, this is a very negative politics. That's what I call a negative revolution. Yeah, uh, and uh, that does not bode well for American democracy. Well, let me let me close with asking you about uh, what's his name, George uh, Santayana. Yeah. Um, you know, do people <laughs> understand the way things have been going well enough to make good decisions going forward, or has the public? And the public is more and more empowered these days with technology, uh, or is the public, you know, have a kind of a bad case of uh, amnesia here? Uh, and amnesia can be very dangerous in a democracy if you don't remember yep. where you've yep. been and where you expect it to go. Right. Um, right. You know, is is the way the public sees the government um, a, a bellwether or a canary in the coal mine? Yeah, I, I think it's it's look, it's possible to get back to a positive politics, but. Um, it takes politicians, quite frankly, being canny and clever. And, uh, you know, the pathway, if, if Democrats are the ones to bring a, a positive politics, then the Democrats have, of course, have a strength, and that's that they polled extremely well among minorities, and especially Hispanics, and Hispanics are becoming a larger and larger part of the American electorate. So uh, that, that bodes well for the Democrats. Um, and uh, I think that the, the thing is... Uh, the Democrats have a record. 
and it's not that bad in the, over the last eight years. The record is not that bad. It didn't, uh, Obama didn't do uh, all that he wanted to do. You know, he was opposed by a Congress that basically rejected everything he proposed. But, um, so I think it's possible to get back to a positive politics, but I think it's going to take a while. The, the other thing that is, should be noted here is that there's a split in the Republican Party. We don't know how deep the split is. I don't think Donald Trump will be able to create a coalition, quite frankly. Mm. I think he's a really divisive politician, and so he'll continue to divide and conquer. And that's going to create uh, some pretty deep seams in the Republican Party, and that also provides an opportunity for Democrats. But the Democrats had their own work to do. I mean, they were really surprised last night that they don't have it together either. And I, I don't, I'm, I'm just, you know, okay, part of it was the insurgency factor, but the other part of it was that Hillary Clinton is a very unpopular figure yeah. for reasons which are, you know, uh, it's too, it's, it's, I think, I see it as a kind of modern tragedy, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, I just, one, one, my, one more question and yes. we'll go, and that is this. I asked uh, Avi Stoifer yesterday from the law school, I asked Tim Vanderveer this morning, uh, I asked him, I asked you the yeah. same question, yeah. are we going to be okay? Well, it's, it's up to us, really. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, it, the thing is, we're a, we're a very divided electorate. Okay? Democracy is very, our democracy is very divided right now. And um, I, I don't honestly know if we're okay, uh, because we've been divided before. But when we were really divided from the 1840s into the 1850s, uh, we couldn't find a solution short of war and uh, civil war and and I'm, I'm not saying you know that we're even close to a civil war but uh this i mean we're so divided there hasn't been a unifier for 16 maybe even more about 16 years in this country you know the, the elections have been 50 50 so we're deeply divided um you know, Trump has made us care more about politics. That might be a good thing. That's the yeah. That, that could that's be a, a positive that, thing. That could be a good thing. Um, but if we notice our divisions more, that might actually caring more actually might be a bad thing too, because people might act more on their divisions. Yeah. Um, I don't. Um, you know, I'm a historian. I, I don't do prognostication. Of course, but we're going to talk to you again <laughs> about it going forward. <laughs> These are interesting times. No. <laughs>